Uh, answers don't always improve things in the nexus. Uh, biofuels were put in as a great way of reducing vulnerability to foreign oil and maybe getting a cleaner kind of fuel. But if you look at India, there's the water for the food and the feed today already approaching water scarcity. Uh, there's the future that need with more population and more prosperity. If you add water for biofuels, you move right off the charts and you're over 100% of water availability. Uh, India is not alone, the European, the European community and the United States are just now adopting new biofuel goals. Uh, and yet there is a proven linkage between putting more land and water into biofuels and the variability in agricultural prices and the shortage of agricultural products. And so we have a very real linkage there. We know now that we're moving away from the era when agricultural prices went down, 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 down for several centuries. And we're now into an area of enormous volatility because when you get a little bit of volatility, you get speculators. When you get speculators, what, what can turn a little bit of volatility into a lot? Adding speculative pressure. And so therefore you get speculation, but if you have to factor in the price of oil, what's happening to biofuels, so therefore your agricultural markets are now reflecting both the price of oil and the price of food and feed. Then you've got enormous volatility, so then you factor in speculators and you're getting something that is now all the time going to go like this, hardest of all on poor people. So when we try and find answers to the nexus, if you take the wrong step, uh, this is what Marcus Mitch was talking about today, he says watch out for some of what looks like the low-hanging fruit. It can be difficult. Water for energy. Water energy uses water. Water uses energy. If you don't want to puzzle through that particular circle, although I stole it from Paul Ryder and it's very simple, um, you can look at it this way. It takes energy to make water. Purifying, distributing water for use, transporting it through pipes and canals, pumping water from aquifers, managing and treating wastewater, desalinating brackish seawater to provide new supplies. You can't yet in an urban world. You can't get new water without new energy. And the more we clean water, the more energy it takes. The further we pump it, the more energy it takes. The bigger our cities get, and the more we want to take wastewater far, far away to clean it, the more energy it takes. So everything about our use of water is growing the energy bill. Uh, water is a critical input in all stages of the power generation cycle. Mining, manufacturing, hydropower, coal and gas, processing, fuel extraction, thermoelectric. You can't, you can run, but you can't hide. Uh, there is simply no form of energy other than wind, other than wind, Vesta is always reminding us this, that is not highly water intensive, if not water dependent. So uh, we certainly need new non-conventional energy sources because we've got nine billion people who are all going to be wanting energy and we need to get rid of this, uh, the, the additional drawdown on water caused by our growing demand for, for energy. The other energy dilemma, three billion people are still using biomass for cooking uh, and they lack electricity anything to green, sustainable, or eco. When you go to Asia now, for most months of the year, there's something called the ABC, the Asian Brown Cloud. Uh, and it covers a very large part of Asia. Even from Kathmandu, you can no longer on most days see the magnificent Himalayas. Uh, and that is going to start filtering more and more of the sunlight. It's going to have a greenhouse gas effect, good or bad. Maybe it'll make up for the black that's falling on the glaciers distracting more, uh, but uh, it is causing uh, upper respiratory disease, it is causing difficulty in terms of agricultural growth, and because that number, the three million, is a growing number rather than a fading number, uh, that is that, that energy dilemma has to be solved too. We need to get non-traditional energy as quickly as possible to people who are still using biomass. Now, what about water for people? The, what's going to happen in the next 20 years in, the, in our nexus triangle? Well, anybody who works in water will be very familiar with these dilemmas. Uh, key challenges in the developing world in terms of delivering water, capital, ability to pay, undercharging, bureaucracies, politics, capacity, deficiencies. 
And we know that this already makes it difficult. Yes, we have achieved much under the, uh, the MDGs and the push towards the MDGs, but it isn't as if the situation is going to stop there. Not just because of the infrastructure that I was talking about, but look at this, I love this chart. This is uh, the way that our expectations of what a city utility will do for us is evolving and how quickly it's evolving. We started off on this side, all we wanted to do was get water supply into a city. So the hydraulics had to be good, okay? Then there had to be a public health benefit. Uh, the water had to be of better quality and you had to sewerage it, otherwise the lack of sewage would get in and interfere with the health benefits. Then we started saying, but yes, we need flood protection as well. So you wanted a drained city, which means channelization and drainage. And then you've also got to make sure what's going in here doesn't get into there and doesn't get into there. But then you start moving up to having a social amenity with environmental protection as well, a waterway city. Point and diffuse source pollution management has to be added into this, particularly in places where industrial water isn't taken away. Then you have the limits on natural resources, the water cycle city. And so this is why the people who are talking about new water forms for cities really have to be brought into GWP, or at least GWP has to learn how to make partnerships with them, because the city is going to have to become, in many ways, its own catchment area, because uh, it is, uh, there are limits on the natural resource of water, and to the extent that we can recycle water to fit for purpose, cleaning it up for a fit for purpose base, and use efficiency, uh, we will be able to have the water within cities that we need, but not if we allow our cities to get up to be 45, 50 million people, and we expect there's going to be new water available for them. There simply isn't going to be. So it's a long way, isn't it, from this humble, just, just pump us some water in, will you? Uh, so this is now pump it, clean it, circulate it, choose it, sort it, uh, and make some of it fit for use again. And then this one, which says the water sensitive city. So that's adaptive, multifunctional infrastructure, urban design, reinforcing water sensitive behaviors. So that's a big change in utilities. Uh, and it is, you can see the pressure for that coming now. And the important thing is that as we urbanize in some areas, is to start adding these functions in and these features in now. So it's a long way. What has to happen? What do we, what do you have? What has to happen to make these things happen all at once? This is a slide I used to use when I was chair of GWP. Uh, and I can give you three ways of looking at a single answer. The first one is to have this map always in the backs of our mind. Uh, that we've got to have an integrated management of industries, forests, fields, the coast, the cities, all the rest of it. We need to think. We need to create governance structures. We need to create policies and integrated policies for the resource, for the management of the resource that will take all of these things into account so that if we need more water, we will know where it is we might find more, how do we protect the water resource, the forest, etc. We This is, as I say, this little chart really says it all. If you start to think about this, you get the picture about what integrated water resource management looks like. This is how McKinsey sees it. So uh, there's an exam at the end of the session, so uh, you will all be tested on this chart. Uh, but this is actually the same thing as that. It says, uh, believe it or not, you know, that one says if you want more water, you should probably either build another dam or get it out of the lake or treat it better or recycle it. And that basically, this basically says the same thing. And it goes from left to right and says, here's the least expensive way that you could actually get more water because India is facing about a 40% deficit in our time period that we're talking about from the water that's currently available. And so therefore, McKinsey did this chart of what it is they could do uh, least expensively, which is over here, but the least expensively is all in agriculture. And of course, Indian farmers, like every other farmer everywhere in the world, is totally amenable to losing water in their agriculture. I'm not. And uh, so therefore, they assume that changing in agriculture is easy because you do get for very small amounts of money. In fact, you get you get something you get a net positive. That's what the the under the line is. As you move across here, you get into much more municipal dams, deep groundwater, ray, all um, ag rainwater harvesting, etc. You get to much more expensive measures, which may or may not actually raise more water. 
Uh, the third way of looking at it is the general principles that are involved in all this. How are we going to get along with water, energy, and, and cities all together? Reduce the demand for water and energy through increased water energy efficiency. Invest in research and development in water energy and ag techniques. Develop and implement practical sustainable tools and standards. Take an integrated approach to policy managing. Policies that promote efficient use of resources and sustainable practices get them complemented by incentive and regulatory programs. That's from the bond program of action. So therefore, all of the, all three of those things are actually saying really the same thing. This is a common sense agenda uh, for the GWP, uh, for anybody that wants to, uh, to say, okay, how do we get out of the situation that we're in? So back to the GWP. They've got the right ingredients in the history for high relevancy, good policy sense, etc. Are they looking at the right part of the problem? The big challenge, I don't think, is going to be in now and in the near term future, doing yet more analyses and more creating more frameworks, policy frameworks. I think that the real challenge is going to be becoming excellent at partnerships. These don't have to be long-term, forever partnerships that are forged with memoranda of understanding. This is called getting together to actually work together on a common issue. And even if it just lasted for a year or so, it could be a very valid partnership. If, for example, uh, you wanted to help somebody understand how much energy was being used in a country, you'd have, you'd have some uh, partnerships with energy uh, producers and energy associations in that country. And that might not be a forever thing, but at the end of the time, you would have a shared idea of the energy impact in water in that particular area. So they can be issue focused. They can be short term. They should be based on mutual interest. They shouldn't be necessarily based on looking for more money for budget for the GWP. Uh, you have to, I think there needs to be more real expertise in implementation. And it doesn't have to be things that were implemented by GWP. What you want to convey is the sense of hope that there are really good ideas out there, that somebody is solving these problems really well. And GWP is in a really fortunate position in that nobody is expecting, with the resources you've got, that you're going to be the, the investor and you're not even going to be the project manager, so you won't even be accountable for the project outcomes. You could talk about really good projects and programs that came out of having a more integrated water policy. But there needs to be much more expertise, I think, in the organization in the kind of implementation that is taking place around the world. Around the world. Skoulis was talking about some of these things today. And he does talk about it in his publications. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and GWP also talks about those. Uh, but I think that, that we could be better here in reaching outside of our, our own partnerships and talking about who's doing good things and, and hold them up as examples of just one part of good integrated water resource management. Now, being GWP, you'll always have people who say, yes, but that didn't include this facet of IWRM, or it didn't include this facet of IWRM. I think what we need to do is look upon this as a process which has to begin, which has to have successes, and then which has to move on. 